as, as Pastor Bronson said, we are in a series called Kingdom Resources. Now, before we kind of get a little understanding of where we'll be at today, last month, in case you are new here, maybe missed the month of October, every October, every year, we take that month as a church to really talk about who we are, where we've been, where we're going. We set time for that month to speak on vision, what we value. It's a way that we kind of like huddle back up together as a church. Because think about it, you are here at third service, there's two other services full of people that you've never seen before. So you're sitting next to strangers and guess what? There are other strangers in other services that call this house, this church, your home. And so in the month of October, we take that time to talk about together, what is our vision? Where are we going? What are we, what are we celebrating? And who are we are? And one of the things that we continually said is that here at Live the Life Church, we will submit and align ourselves unapolog unapologetically, meaning we're not going to apologize for our stance in aligning ourselves in the way God has commanded us to live by his kingdom and through his kingdom of God. That here at Live the Life Church, and let me tell you something, we aren't here still today healthy and thriving because of um, 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 good theory. Our church isn't celebrating 26 years of light change, celebrating 26 years of ministry because we, we, we applied the, the, the newest wave of ministry or we, we went on TikTok and found the next way to grow a church. We're here because we have founding pastors, lead pastors, leaders in this house who have said all yes together that we will submit ourselves under God's authority. Where he goes, we will go. What he says, we will do. And what he calls us to, we will answer. And so in saying that, that goes for even our finances. And this series, Kingdom Resources, again, unapologetically, without apology, we are going to talk about finances. We're going to talk about our money. And we're going to talk about it in a way that it aligns with God's kingdom. Because our prayer for this entire series is that we as a church, third service, second service, and first service, that all of us to get together, we that are Christians and who call this home, LTL, our house, our home, we together, our prayer is that we would be the living examples of what it looks like to, to, be, to be kingdom obedient, to be kingdom faith, to be kingdom stewards of our resources. That's not just a call for our pastors. That's not just a standard for our leaders. That is a call for us. That our world is in desperate need of not another podcast and not another good advice, but Christians living biblically and being stewards of how God has called us to be with our resources. So with that being said, I want to pray before we really jump into this thing. So Father, we just come and we just thank you. Thank you for what, you, for what you've done. Thank you for what you're doing. Lord, we surrender ourselves to you. We don't have to do anything other than just give you a simple yes. Our, our ears are here. Our eyes are open. Our heart is ready to receive what you want to be sown. And I pray that what you sow today would produce a harvest in our life that blesses those around us. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Amen, amen. Um, anybody, anybody married in here? Anybody married in here? Come on, let me see your hands. Come on, sit up. Yeah, okay. I like the energy. Um, if you're not married, you can just act like it. Hey, um, and so if, for all the married in people, I got a question. I got a question for you. And this is my question. For those of you who are married, when you were dating your now spouse, remember that. They're sitting next to you. You're still with them, right? When you were dating them, right, and you got over the honeymoon phase of kind of keeping everything in the closet, trying to make yourself presentable and look nice, was there ever a moment in that dating process where you saw something or they said something you thought was a little weird? Like, like you, you were dating them, you're like, I'm, I, this is the girl, but then they do something, you're like, hold on, what was that? Like, what would you, wait, I, I never seen that before, that's a little weird. Can, you, like, they say something really quickly, and you're like, hold on, run that back because I don't think I heard you correctly because it sounded like you said, I, this may be kind of a, the deal breaker, right? Um, I bring that up because there was this one time when my wife and I were dating, and at the time I was living with my parents. And I was on the opposite side of town, and I needed something. It doesn't matter. I don't remember what it was. But she was close by the house, and we were going to meet up later. And I said, hey, babe, I really need this thing, but you need to go to my parents' house, my house that I was living in. And I need you to grab it for me, and we'll meet up later, and you can give it to me then. And she said, yeah, no problem. The only issue is, babe, that I don't have a key to your parents' house. Y'all got a code. I don't know the garage code. Like, I, I can't get in. And I nonchalantly, real cool and chill, and say, oh, babe, don't worry about it. We leave the door, we leave it open. It, you can just go in. Again, for me, I'm thinking, this is what I do. I just leave the door unlocked. And for her, she goes silent, and I was like, you, you're good? Like, 
did you hear me? And she goes, what did you just say? And again, I say it again, but for some reason, I got a little more riz to it. And now, baby girl, it's open. Like, it's unlocked. Like, you don't need a code. Just go on in. This is how we live. And she goes, Jory, are you kidding? You would have thought she, she said, like, I said that I was an axe murderer or something. She was like, Jory, you're telling me that for as long as I have known you, you just leave your front door open for anyone that can just walk in. Now, mind you, I don't live in the country. I'm in a normal neighborhood. She's like, you're telling me that anyone can just walk in and just take what you want, they take what they want and eat. And I'm like, well, when you say it like that, it's a little weird. But the way I see it is if there's a killer running after me, I ain't going to die because I don't have to worry about trying to get the key to lock in. I'm like, I'm smart. You're dumb. Come at me, right? And she's like, babe, th this ain't happening. Because when we get our house, we are not doing that. So long story short, it wasn't a deal breaker, but now we have like 15 logs, 20 different codes, all this chained up. I'm just kidding. But what came to my revelation, thank you, Holy Spirit, last service, what's funny is we do lock everything, have codes and all that. I don't leave the front door open anymore. Um, but what's funny is all that talk from my wife. And there was this one time we got locked out of our house. With the, there was a power outage, the Wi-Fi, the garage is connected to it, couldn't open. We The key, I, I got the wrong um, pair of keys and I just didn't have it. I was like, man, what happened? Guess what? I forgot to lock the back door and we got it. Hey, come on. Let's bow our heads and pray. Nah, I just get it right. It's like, let's, let's get out of here. I say all that because you're like, Pastor Joe, what does that have to do anything with money? I'm so glad you asked. I say all that because the point I want to make is going to be the foundation in which we build off of today. I want to make a point to you that doesn't just have to do with your finances. But it's how in which we should live our life from with Christ. We need to know what I'm about to tell you. So if you have your phone, take a picture. If you're taking notes, write it down. And this is the point I want to make. It's that anything that is not submitted to the lordship of Jesus is open to spiritual defeat and deception. Hear me, church. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus for 50 years or you've been walking with him for five minutes. Anything that is not submitted to the lordship of Jesus is open to spiritual defeat and deception. What I mean is that anything that we have not surrendered and submitted to the lordship. What do you mean by lordship? Meaning what, what, if we have not submitted to the rule, the reign, the authority, a better way of saying it is all the things that we have not allowed God to have a voice in, in our lives. It's like having a front door wide open for anything and anyone other than God to come and influence, speak into, deceive, and to take precedence over. And when that door is wide open, it leaves our beliefs, our priorities, our values, our identity, our sexuality, and finances open to spiritual defeat. When we don't submit all of that unto the Lord, it is free game. For your flesh, this world, and the enemy to have its way. So, for example, if our beliefs aren't submitted to the authority of Scripture, then the next trending voice on TikTok will begin to form your ideology. Parents, if you aren't teaching your children to submit their beliefs to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, the thing, the device that they're swiping through will become their discipler, will become their rabbi, and will form the ideology and viewpoint of how they look at this world and perceive this world and how they respond to this world. Another example is if our priorities aren't submitted to the will of the Father, then our work and, dare I say, even our kids can easily become the leader of our life. If our identity isn't submitted to the Lord, then the next girl that gives you attention or the guy that tells you what you want to hear will then become very quickly the voice that shapes and molds your life. I say that because it leads us to Mark chapter 10. And we see this principle of non-submitted things being open to deception in Mark chapter 10. And we see it between Jesus and a rich young ruler. To paraphrase, the story goes that this young man, this rich young man, goes to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, we don't know if he worked to get rich, but based upon his question, it sounded like he got used to inheriting finances. Because now he's wanting to inherit eternal life. Jesus responds with, you know the commands. Don't steal, kill, cheat, commit adultery. 
And in verse 20, we read that he, the, this, the, um, the rich young man says, teacher, he declared, I, all these things I've kept since I was a little boy. I've done all those things, Jesus. I've heard all that. I, I've gone to church. I checked all the boxes. I say my prayers. I read the Bible. I, I do all those things. I'm really nice to the poor. I checked all those boxes, boxes, but I'm still missing something. And I'm still lacking something. And Jesus responds with, he looked at him and loved him. And he says, one thing you do lack. Jesus acknowledges that there is a lack. And, and we're about to see his response. Like, we're getting ready to be like, man, he's about to tell us what he's lacking. This is going to be good. And look at his response. Jesus says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Well, that wasn't the answer we're looking for. So what is Jesus saying? What Jesus is saying is to the young man, there is one thing you lack. And that one thing is me but you don't have me because there's no room for me in your life. Jesus is saying, you're right, you do lack something, and that thing you're lacking is not a thing that you can inherit. It's a person that you must be in relationship with. And the reason why you are lacking and don't have me is not because Jesus doesn't give himself freely to those who are in need, but he says, there's no room for me in your life. You lack, Jesus says, because you do not give. And all that you have and keep has filled your life, giving no room for my spirit. See, the problem wasn't that the young man was rich. It's that riches had him. This young man had a God, but it wasn't Jesus. It was money. See, it was evident to Jesus, Cassius, it was evident to Jesus that this young man's treasures, this young man's finances, whatever this young man had inherited to make him rich, none of it was submitted to the lordship of him. And what that meant was it left it all open for spiritual defeat and deception to come and take and destroy. What do I mean by spiritual de destroying and, and, and spiritually deception when we leave it open, not submitted to, the, to Jesus? What I mean is that whatever we thought it is that made us whole and feel good, that will easily become our God. And when the, winds crash, when the winds come and the waves crash, we will easily find out, and all of us probably have that testimony, where the very thing we thought was our God, so it didn't need to be submitted, it comes quickly crashing down. And then we see what happens to the young man. In Matthew 10, verse 22, it says that at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So what I want to talk today about is about submitting our finances to the Lordship of Jesus. I want to talk to us as a church about submitting our finances, our resources, our income, what we work for, submitting it to the Lord. Because church, let me tell you, if it is not submitted to the Lord, it is free game for your flesh to use as it wants, for this world to take as it wants, and for this enemy to destroy as it wants. And that what we do when we submit our finances to the Lordship and give him a voice and give him authority over our finances. What that is, is tithing. See, I believe that tithing is the submitting of our finances to the Lordship of Jesus. So maybe if you're new here and you've never heard of that word, maybe you're a Christian in here and you've heard it but never done it. Or maybe you've been like myself walking in it and still walking through the process. I believe this is all for us. To learn, to be refreshed, and also for some of us to break out of. And so the question I want to ask is, what is tithing? What is tithing? You, you, hear, you hear us say it every service, Pastor Bronson just said, hey, this is the time. We're going to take up offerings and giving. We're going to give of our tithes. What does that mean? I want you to write this down and take a picture of it. The tithe is the first 10% of our income. Given back to God for the building of his house, the expanding of his kingdom, for the glory of his name. And this act of obedience, this act of worship, of tithing, giving God our first, it is directly benefiting us and blessing our life. God does not destroy. God does not curse. He does not, he does not harm us. And so when he calls us to something, establishes something, it is to bless it is to grow. It is to cultivate in our lives. See, the word tithe comes from a Hebrew word meaning a tenth part. The word tithe is literally a mathematical term, meaning 10% of a whole. But in, in, in God's word, 
when God uses it, when we read it in scriptures throughout God's story, where we usually hear the tithe is this right here. It's usually someone, excuse me, not usually, majority of it is used in the context of someone setting apart a tenth of their increase. A tenth. Why? Tithe is ten. A tenth. They're setting it aside, consecrating it, labeling it. This is God's. And they're setting aside the first tenth of what they just got in increase, what they just got paid for. And they offer it back to the Lord to bless his name, to build his church, and to expand the kingdom. Now the first observation that I want to make about tithing is this. The tithe is the revelation that the Lord is worthy of our first. Hear me, hear me, hear me. Please, 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 come on. The tithe is the revelation. It's a revelation that we have, that we got, that the Lord is worthy of our first. There is a lot of Christians today who have the revelation that God is first. He's above all, he's before all, he's the alpha and the omega. In the beginning was God. We can say, yeah, God's Lord, he's king, he's ruling, he's on the throne. But, but when we don't tithe, what that is saying and what I'm seeing is that we as Christians have not got the revelation of not that he's Lord above all, but that he's first in my life and so I give him my first. Tithing is the revelation that I understand that God is worthy of my first. See, what gives tithing its favor, what gives tithing its power is not in the amount. It's not in the percentage. If you, if you have gotten lost in the sauce of a, a, a percentage and a number, then you're missing it. You're just checking off a box. If we preach this message in series and everyone started tithing, but you don't have a revelation and you don't live from a place that God is worthy of your first, then honestly I'm saying just take it back. Just, just take it back and don't give in the first place because you have not received the revelation. Not that he's Lord and first, but that he is worthy of your first. And it's when we give that 10%, that tithe, first to God, that there is power and there is blessing and there is his right hand of favor on it. See, in Exodus 23, verse 19, the Lord says, bring the best, bring the best, bring your best of the first fruits of your soil. So the house of the Lord, your God. See, the first time we see an offering to the Lord, catch this, the first time we see an offering to the Lord is not in, in Exodus with the Ten Commandments under the Levitical law. The first time we ever see an offering to the Lord is in Genesis given by Adam and Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. In Genesis 4, chapter 2, it says this, that now Abel kept flocks. Abel was over the livestock, over the animals. And Cain, his brother, worked the soil, the grain, over the fruits and harvest. And in the course of time, Cain, who was over the fruits, brought some of the fruit of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering. Fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel. He looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Now, time out. Let's all ask the question. Why does God look on favor of Abel's offering but not Cain's? Is God keto? Is he just eating like a protein diet? Is he like me more or like what's, what's his deal? Well, No. Is it because of the portion? Was it bigger in the, in the meat? Was it more tenderized than, than what the amount of fruit that Cain brought? Well, no, because we don't ever hear about how much the amount was. So then why did God look on favor of Abel's offering instead of Cain's? Because Abel, Abel's offering was from the firstborn. Cain's offering was from some of the fruit. Abel in faith gave from the firstborn. Cain gave some of the fruit. And the crazy thing about it is we don't even know if Cain gave the last fruit. What's scary to know, Cain probably could have even given the second harvest. It's still fresh. It's still good. But it wasn't first. Because the tithe is the first tenth of our increase given back to God. Now I want to give you a practical example of what tithing is not. Because this is not just something Old Testament that's like, oh, that's good information. This is what we should be applying in our lives. And so I want to show you what tithing is not. And so here I have $10, and this is my paycheck. Every month I get paid twice a month. 
And so today I got paid $10, and 10% of 10 would be $1. This is what tithing is not. I get paid. Man, pastor, I got to keep a roof over my head. I'm the man of the household. I got to provide. I got to make sure the mortgage company is paid. We can't be losing a house. Can't live in on these streets. Like, we got to make sure I ain't that good looking. We can't be doing that. I got a, I got a house. I need a house. It's a joke. Okay. All right. Move on. Then you're like, pastor, but I got bills to pay. We got we to gotta make sure electricity is on. We got to make sure these kids get Wi-Fi. They'd be driving me crazy thinking on Wi-Fi. Like, we ain't kidding, man. Like, so we got to pay the Wi-Fi. We need, like, but we can't just have Wi-Fi. We, we need a subscription. We need to make sure we got the Netflix and the, and the Hulu and the, and the Disney Plus. And why can't they all just come together? But we got to buy them all. So we got to make sure we're all entertained. I got to make sure that's covered. And I could have just kept the car I paid off. But because I paid it off, I'm thinking, man, I can get a new car. So now I got a car payment that has to get handled. And, Pastor, I don't know if you've been, but Starbucks, I know it's November, but they got the Red Cups now. So I got to make sure, like, I, I can't be going to work crazy. Like, I got to get my Starbucks. Got to make sure it's good. And it's fall season, so the kids are in sports. So they got to get it. And, Pastor, I don't know about you, but, like, I need a gym membership because holidays are coming up. And if I don't counterbalance this thing, I'm just going to get real bad. So I got to make sure I go to the gym and work out look good. And then a, a week goes by, and you're like, Pastor, I didn't go to the gym, so I just need to go buy a new outfit because I ain't fitting in these jeans. And... <laughs> And then you're like, well, well, Pastor, like Instagram, now you have to pay for the, the, the blue check to be verified. So I got to make sure people know it's me and that people can follow me. And at the end of the month, they're like, okay, everything got covered. Okay, God, here. This is yours. This is not me getting after you. I just talked to a, a gentleman, and I loved it because this is the majority. He said, you know, Pastor, I didn't even know. I didn't even know that that was not what God asked of me. Because what's crazy is a lot of us are doing it in good heart. No one's saying it. No, this is not a message of stop taking care of your families. No, that's got to get paid. But you really think you care more about your family than God? You really think you care more about your needs and wants than God? Because what we end up doing is we end up making sure our responsibilities are covered and more important and done, and we end up giving God our leftovers. And let me tell you something, giving God your leftover, it's not a tithe, it's a tip. And we tip based upon grading someone's work. So you go eat. And depending on how well they serve you, oh my gosh, hear that. Depending on how well they served you determines how much you're going to get tipped. And so what we end up doing is saying, man, God, you really took care of me. And so you know what, with this, I'm just going to say thank you for covering me. And so we start treating God like our server. We start treating God like a waiter. We start grading his performance. When things are good, hey, God, you got it. But when things are bad, sorry, God, I guess you could have done better. It's kind of tight right now. That's not the tithe. And I'm not putting that on you. But if we don't know, we'll just continue living that way, not knowing we're treating the Lord that way. I'm, I'm trying to raise you up to the higher standard, to what God is calling you. This is not a higher standard. It's God's obedience and what he's called us as sons and daughters to live by. And God is not our server. He is Lord. He is Yahweh. He is King. He is Jehovah. He is provider. He is good. And I don't want you living. This, this is what I'm trying to get you to understand. I don't want you living, treating God that way. Because there is no blessing in that. There is no favor on that. But this is tithing. Every month, payday comes, and as if you're an adult in here, just as soon as we get the check, bills start arriving, the wants start coming, the needs start coming. Yet, in the midst of all of life's stresses and the adult responsibilities, which we all have, by the way, this is what tithing is. Tithing is saying, God, I'm going to trust you with my first. I'm going to intentionally make sure that when I take a picture of my check, send it to my phone, bling, and hits the account. That I, I, This is practically what I do. I say, babe, I text her, I call her, I stop her, say, hey, babe, I'm going to tithe first. Let's just say a quick prayer. Lord, we thank you. This is our first. We're not going to pay a bill. I'm going to make sure you get this first. Yes, I actually do that. And when we give, what tithing is, is we say, God, I trust you with my 10. But at the same time, I'm going to have faith and believe 
that you won't just get me by, but you're going to bless me, you're going to sustain me, you're going to enrich me with the remaining 90%. Yes, there is a practical, intentional way of tithing. That, yes, looks like going and budgeting your finances, looking at what you got paid, going on the calculator and saying, if I got $10, 10% means one. So let me go to the church app now and click on tithing, put my account in there and make sure, or coming in and pulling out the cash that would be your tithe and putting an envelope. And some of us think, no, that's too much work. But you weren't saying it was too much work when you were trying to get Taylor Swift tickets. When you were trying to get the iPhone 15. When you were trying to buy the next or rent the next equipment, that's not too much work. You'll get it done. Why? Because it's priority. And that's first. But when it comes to the tithe, it's too much to be intentional of making sure God is going to get the proper amount and it's going to be first. See, the thing about tithe being first is this, that giving God your first, it requires faith. Remember the story of Cain and Abel? Why, why, why did God look on favor of Abel's offering? Because of why he gave it his first. Look what Hebrews says in 11 verse 4. By faith, by faith, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain. Man, that's really judgmental and mean. I think they were both giving. No, 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 no. God said it's better. Why? Because it's first. Why does that matter? Because it requires faith to give first. It doesn't take faith to give 10% to God after making sure you were taken care of. All of a sudden, that's, that's making God our insurance plan. See, God, when we, when we make sure we're covered first, then we give the leftover or the last 10%, God doesn't get any credit in that. What gets the credit is your job. What gets the credit is your overtime, the hours you put in. What gets, it, what gets the credit is you, your budgeting skills. What gets the credit is your promotion, your work ethic. And that's not the kingdom way of living and ruling our finances. See, it takes faith to believe God will take care of you with only 90%. Because when, not if, when you're taken care of by God with the 90 God gets the credit. And that's why we say it is better to live with God and have the favor of God with 90 than it is the 100 by ourselves. That is tithing. And this, this is where I want to slow down and, and honestly be personal and honest and real with you guys. Because it's easy to start thinking, well, that's easy for you, pastor. It wasn't always. Can I be honest for just a second? It wasn't always because I always didn't tithe. I wasn't always a tither. I didn't always tithe because my parents didn't teach me what tithing was. And my parents didn't teach me what tithing was, not because they were bad parents, but because their parents didn't teach them what tithing was. And they weren't bad parents. It was because their parents didn't teach them what tithing was. So the Lopez last name family legacy has been going on far as I can know of not knowing what tithing was. And from that, that cycle kept going and going to where it hit me. And from that cycle of not knowing what tithing was, I formed as a young child a poverty mindset that I'm honestly still breaking today. This is not something you're just facing. But every person that walks on this platform that's a human is facing this same thing. See, I grew up with a poverty mindset not because we were poor. Now, I understand that some of your stories, it just wasn't mine. We didn't grow up poor. We didn't live on the streets. No one was cracked out. My parents were together. We had a nice home, and we were blessed. We were, we were spoiled, and I'm so grateful for my parents. But yet, in the midst of all that blessing, I still had a poverty mindset. So when processing why I had this mindset, the Lord revealed it to me this Sunday. And this is what I told Pastor Bronson. I said, if no one gets it, and if everyone were to fall asleep and not listen, me, the revelation that I received from writing this sermon is enough. But I pray you receive and see yourself and, and begin to apply this stuff. This is what the Lord revealed to me. He, because I was wondering, God, why, why do I have this poverty mindset? I was taken care of. My life was good. People had it worse. And he said this, you have a poverty mindset because you grew up believing your parents was the only source of provision for your life. You grew up believing that everything began and ended with your parents. Now you're probably thinking, well, pastor, that's our job, isn't it? Yes. 
only if it's submitted under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And as a child, I thought, and what I'll say here in a second is I put my parents as my God, as my source, as everything I get. What I mean is I grew up only ever knowing of my parents being my provider, not God. I grew up only ever relaying, relying on my parents, excuse me, for provision, not God. And when you rely on parents like I did to be what only God can be, you begin to recognize their limitations. Even at a young age, I could pick up on subtle hints of stresses and worries that the weight of finances brought on them. I couldn't put it into words then, but what I would experience and what I would see is what I considered my source, my God, my parents, a.k.a. I saw them struggling to take care of me. And without knowing better, I put my parents in the position of God. So hear me when I say it was like seeing God wondering how he could get me a new pair of shoes while also paying for the baseball tournament, while also making sure I had food to eat that evening. To put it in kids' terminology, what I was experiencing and what I felt like, it was like seeing Superman bleed for the first time, and it was my wants and needs that were cutting through. So my poverty mindset was birthed out of my response to this fear and shame of mine. I didn't see it then, but I made sure I wouldn't be the reason to make my parents go broke. I couldn't put it into words then, but it, I, I just, it was in me, ingrained in me, that every time I wanted something, I felt guilty. I felt shame. Is this too much? What's going to happen? Are we going to have enough? So things like back to school shopping, kids' favorite day, getting clothes and shoes, it was my worst nightmare. Because I couldn't help but think the entire time, well, if that shirt is $15, and maybe we could eat this, and but that's too much. And so what would happen is I'd have a pile of clothes that my mom would be like, son, get them. It looks so good on you. It fits well. You're going to need it for the fall. Go ahead. Get that one, too. Get it in two colors. And what started as like 15, a pile, like 15 clothes on, in a pile, by the time I would check out, I would look at things on my way to the checkout line, and I would say, no, mom, you know, I don't really need this one. Mom, I have one like this. I, I'll, just, I'll just stick with that one. We'll get this one later. Mom, I think there's a cheaper pair of shoes there. We'll just get those. And all of a sudden, what started as 10, I'm checking out with three. Because I didn't want to be the reason why we went broke. But yet, we were, we were covered. We were fine. But any time I saw or heard the stresses of my parents on finances, it was like God struggling to me. That's why I didn't want big birthday parties, because they were already getting me gifts. But then to ask them to entertain my friends, no, 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 no. I'm just good with going out to eat. Now, you, you can imagine heading into my teen and adult years, hearing about the tithe for the first time. I didn't always tithe. We pastors up here, we didn't always tithe. No one walks into this world, born into this world thinking, I'm ready to tithe. Yours, yours. No, we walk in this world being mine. It's me. It's don't touch. It's mine. So I walk into this church. I walk into this place, this atmosphere. And the idea of not just giving a God a percentage but trusting him to be my provider, it turned my world upside down. But let me tell you something, church. Every time I tithe, this is my testimony. Every time I tithe, since the moment I walked in this place, that little boy in me who didn't want to be the financial burden to my parents, he is being healed and loved by the heavenly father who doesn't let the righteous forsaking or begging for bread. That little boy in me who didn't want to be the one that crushed my parents is being secured and being taken care of by the father who owns a thousand cattle on a hill. That he is being restored in love and allowing the father to provide for him. See, since I have been tithing, every month I see the Lord provide, sustain, and take care of me. And it's not because I got financially wise. It's not because I downloaded these three podcasts. It's not because I started listening to Dave Ramsey, although it's great. It's not because I got on a budget, but it's because I trusted the Lord with my first. And I began to see in my life that he was worthy of it, day in and day out. That's why I tithe. The second observation very quickly is that the tithe, as we've been saying it last week, it reminds us that everything belongs to the Lord, that God is our source. We're reminded that the tithe is us literally saying, Lord, this is yours. We're not going to touch it. But actually, this is all yours. In 1 Chronicles 29, to summarize it, we see King David who, who wants to build the Lord a temple to reside in. At the current time, the Lord's presence would del dwell in the tent. And it was portable and, follow the, and the people would move the tent everywhere they went. 
But King David says, I live in a palace in royalty, and my God lives in a tent. I'm going to build him a temple. And before they started building this temple, listen to David's, King David's prayer for this. In 1 Chronicles 29, verses 12 through 14, it says this, Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. And I love this. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give generously as this? Listen, everything comes from you. And we have given you only what comes from your hand. Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple. For your holy name, it comes from your hand. And all of it belongs to you. See, David received a revelation that must become foundational for us as believers. The revelation in this prayer that we just read is the same revelation we receive every time that we tithe. And what that is, is and when we tithe, we are reminded that everything in our life is a gift from God. Not just the tenth, but everything. When we tithe, we are also reminded that we are only stewards of the Lord's blessing. That we are but managers in this world. We're, we are not creator. We are creation. We are stewards of the gift that God has given us. But most importantly, when we tithe, I love this, it shows God that we recognize he is the owner of everything. It's not one thing to just say it. It's not one thing to just pray it. It's not one thing to just sing a song about it. But every time I tithe, I'm putting my belief and my faith into action saying, no, God, I acknowledge that you own everything. You are the giver of everything. I don't want to just be someone who speaks. I want to be someone who acts in faith. See, at our growth group this Wednesday, and I'm almost done, we were with a few couples, and we started talking about the five love languages. Now, in case you don't know what that is, the five love languages is a book that was written and basically says that everyone receives and gives love based out of these five ways of love. So either receive love or give love through physical touch, quality time, gifts, um, words of affirmation and acts of service. And during that time, everyone started expressing, you know, I, I, I feel love like this. I, I like to receive love this way. And my wife began to say, I, I receive love through quality time and gifts. Now, imagine with me, it would be so naive of me to hear her say how she received love. It would be so naive to, after hearing that, that when we got home and in the next days to come, I would love her in the way I prefer. It would be so naive of me after hearing how she prefers to be loved to then just be like, start loving her through physical touch, which is mine and not hers. Through acts of service, which is mine and not hers. What would even be worse is, is then she recognizes it and she goes, hey, babe, I know we talked about it, but this is how I really prefer to be loved. And you're loving me the way you like to be loved. And I think there's a disconnect. It would be even worse if I said, babe, I think, I think you're being a little narcissistic right now. Like, why don't, why don't you, you're not being appreciative. I'm, I'm loving you. I think you're really making this like an obligation. Like, don't you just, don't you know I love you? I already put the ring on it. Don't you know I said it on our vows? Like, isn't that enough? And then I go on ignoring you. What am I trying to say? When we tithe, we are loving God the way he prefers to be loved. Take the law out of it. Take the Old Testament out of it. Take the New Testament, uh, Testament out of it. God, throughout his scripture, it is he is clear on how he likes to be loved, preferred to be loved. And who are we as his bride to think, ah, God, I think you're just being a little narcissistic. I think you're just being a little unappreciative. Don't, wouldn't you just accept it? It's just good. Right? I gave, God. I gave you something. In Exodus Chapter 20, the Lord tells us how he likes to be loved. You shall have no other gods before me. I prefer to be loved this way. I prefer to be first in your life. You know what we do when we tithe? God, there's no other gods before you. You are rightful owner of this first. It says that in the book of Revelation that the elders who sit at his feet lay down their crowns and worship him. And this is what they say in verse 11 the elders, and we will join them one day. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. There's a preferred way that God likes to be loved.
matters and is us putting him first and giving him our first. And again, it's not because you're bad. The honest truth is for you, you're probably sitting there, I just didn't know. But this is why I'm telling you. So we can all get in line and under the word of the Lord. And I have my last point and I'm done here. The tithe is a testament It's a witness to the resurrection. When we tithe, it is a witness. It is a testament to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. What do you mean by that? I'm going to paraphrase, but I literally want to just take you through the Bible. We're going to look in Genesis, we're going to look in Exodus, and we're going to go to the New Testament with Jesus. And I want you to see a repeated pattern throughout the entire Bible. In the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2, from the very beginning, we see that this is gar- God's garden. He creates a garden called Eden, and it's God's. We know it's God because he, he allows Adam and Eve to be um, um, stewards and managers of the garden. He says, you can, you can go and manage this. Go and, and, and work it and take care of it because it's mine. But then we also see God say this. He says, you are free to eat from all of the trees. You're you're free to eat from all of these trees, all of this resource. Just don't eat from this one. What God is saying is there is plenty of resource, plenty of provision in the garden without this one tree. Let me say it again. Catch it. You don't need that tree. That one's mine. But there is plenty of provision without that one. So what was God's plan and purpose behind saying that? What did God envision that we didn't get to see? I believe God's envision of establishing that between Adam and Eve is that Adam and Eve, as generations would come and as they would have children, one day their children would come to them and they say, Daddy, Mommy, why don't we eat from that tree? And God saw that Adam and Eve would say, Hey, son, that's the Lord's tree. We're so gracious to give us all these other trees. And we are, we are completely supplied and blessed with all these other trees. But that one, it's God's because he said it's his. So we're not going to touch that one because God has provided all of our needs and met all of our needs with the tree. See, God's hope and what God envisioned was that the future generations would know that the Lord provided their needs. But if you've read the beginning in Genesis, we know that they didn't last quickly. Adam and Eve would then disobey and eat from that one tree. They would eat from the one tree. So generations would pass and we find the Israelites, God's people, on the verge of their freedom of 400 years of being slaves to the Egyptian empire. And they are at the edge, not even, excuse me, they haven't even got to the Red Sea that we read God would then split so they could have their freedom. Slaves for 400 years, generation after generation. These people didn't know what a human was because all they'd known was slavery. And before they ever get to the edge of the Red Sea, we see God speak to Moses and says, hey, I need you to tell the people something. He says, tell them, I'm going to get you to where I promise you. I'm going to get you to the promised land. But then he says, but when you get there, because I'll make sure you get there, I want every man to take the firstborn out of the womb of your livestock, every firstborn animal, I want you to take it and kill it and sacrifice it to me. And you're probably thinking like, man, that's, that's, that's a little much. Why, why, would, why would he do that? Why would he set that up? Exodus 13, verses 14 through 15. In the days to come, when your son asks you, what does that mean? Say to your son, with the mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why, this is why, this is why I sacrificed to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb. What does that mean? That means, hey, Israelites, when you get to that promised land, there's going to come a day as you're sacrificing throughout the years the firstborn of your offspring from your livestock. And there's going to be a day where your son comes to you and says, hey, daddy, why, why is it that every time our animals give birth, you take the first one and you kill it? What if that's the only one they give birth to? 
What if we run out of animals? Why do you keep killing the firstborn? And he says, then you can get down and say, son, we didn't always live in the promised land. Son, we weren't always free. Listen to me, son. Daddy was a slave once. Grandpa was a slave once. But by the mighty right hand of God, he split the Red Sea. And he saved us from slavery. That you now get to eat the fruit of the promise of God. So why does daddy kill the firstborn every time? Because God is reminded that he was once a slave, but now he is free. And if the Lord that saved me wants the first, he will get daddy's first. Do you see the repeated pattern of the story that God desired his, his people to tell? But if you've read the Bible, you know that the Israelites would live in rebellion. And fast forward generations where we find ourselves in the New Testament. Generations would pass and we find still a broken world bound to their sin in need of a savior. And then the Lamb of God, Matthew chapter 1, the New Testament, the Lamb of God steps foot into the scene. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, becoming the atoning sacrifice for all of humanity, giving us access to the Father once again. And in Hebrews 7 verse 8, look what the New Testament says. It says, here mortal men receive tithes. Here on earth, in the church, mortal men receive and gather the tithe. But look, look, it doesn't end there. But there, he, who? Jesus receives them. When you give our tithes, when we give our tithes, here on earth, mortals, pastors, the leadership of this house will collect the tithes. But when you give that tithe, he receives it. And why is that so significant? Because um, of whom it is witness that he lives. My tithe is a witness that Jesus isn't still in the tomb, but he is resurrected and has bought my penalty and has paid and covered me and washed me in the blood of Jesus. Every time I tithe, it is a reminder. Listen. Listen, I, I, I pray this over your life, parents, those who have accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who have been redeemed by the blood. A day is coming, in fact, it is now here, where our sons and daughters are going to come to us one day. And they're going to say, Daddy, why do you give that much money to the church? Daddy, why do you why do you always every time you get paid you you stop us and pray you don't let us buy anything and tell us we're gonna give for why do you do that and this is where we get to say baby girl will you join Daddy wasn't always a Christian hey baby girl Daddy wasn't always good Daddy was a bad man Daddy was broke. flesh. Daddy was addicted. But by the grace of God, but by his mighty right hand, through the giving of his son, Jesus Christ, he took daddy out of the dominion of darkness and has brought daddy into the light. And if the Lord physically walk through a Red Sea, but baby girl, I was in darkness, and God has taken me from death to life, to life. And I am reminded, Leah Joy, that every time that we give our first to Him, that I, always, well, I wasn't always. More importantly, I shouldn't be here. But thanks be to God, who is worthy of our first, because God didn't tithe His Son he gave us to it. He gave us to him completely. This is why we tithe. This isn't a law. This isn't an obligation. This is a revelation that we are not God. We are not in control. 
We do not own anything, but we are but stewards. And by the grace of God, we see him day after day, generation after generation, save us as humanity. And now we get to live in the fullness of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so all the more, how much more now, because we have the, the one and only perfect lamb that was slain, how much more would we give of our Church, I, I give you this not to say I got you. There isn't a, so as you leave here, we're going to have everyone sign. I leave this into your hands. Now that you know, and I beg of you as a brother in Christ, Revelation that I, I have. That we won't allow, we won't allow the next generation to not know of the slavery that we were born in. Your tithe talks. And for the church, the church has been too silent and too quiet for too long about what God has done. And I'm not talking about you going to the bullhorn telling people about Jesus on the street. I'm talking about you sitting in this pew with your family saying, God gets the first. Your tithe talks. It is a testimony that Jesus Christ lived, died, and was buried, and is now resurrected. And by that death and resurrection, we are saved. We are now righteous, clothed in righteousness, and have the ability to stand in right standing with God. We don't get that anywhere else and from no one else other than God. So, Father, we come and we thank you. God, who are we that we would give so generously? Help us to get the revelation that we own nothing. God, I pray that we as a church would be a church of faith. A church that truly believes that you don't just own everything, but you take care. I just believe the Lord is looking for his sons and daughters to trust him. The Lord is looking for tr trust among the land. Well, let me say it again. The Lord is looking for trust among this city. And will he find live the life, a church, a people, a community that trusts the Lord? This is not about a financial obligation. This is about a revelation who our Lord is. He is worthy and worthy to be praised. God, we give you our first because you deserve it. We give you our first and we're reminded that you own all things. And we give you our first as a testimony for the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. Thank you, God. May faith fill the room. May we leave here with